I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Mrs. Mayor, if you do the roll call, please. I'd be happy to. Gary Dunlap. Here. Tom Cruise is excused, I think? Yes. Um, Jeff Young. Here. Welcome. Um, Cheryl Hancock. Here. And Anita Jagosinski. Here. I'm here. Lisa Collins. Here. And um, Tim Medicare. Sorry. Here. Okay, with six of the seven school board members present, I would declare a quorum. Board norms, I would just remind the board members your norms are in your folder, and if you would. Um, Take a look at those as we proceed this evening. That would be wonderful. Approval of the agenda. I would note that the agenda has been posted, distributed, and sent to local media. Um, we do have one correction. If you would um, delete item 9.3. And with that said, are there any other changes to the agenda? Otherwise, I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda as amended, mm -hmm. deleting item 9.3. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. <coughs> Public participation. Is there anyone who wishes to address the board relative to any item at this time? We ask that a five minute time period per person be followed. Please come forward, state your name, address, and topic to be addressed. I know we have a full house this evening, but I think it is under recognition. So we will move forward since I don't see anyone coming to the microphone. So recognition and thank yous for an exchange students, Dr. Carlson. I'm going to invite Mr. Bear up front and he's going to recognize our exchange students that are with us this evening. And then also then afterwards, we want our students to remain up here after they make their comments and so on. And then we'll have Mrs. Hancock come around and um, join in a photo as well as we present some certificates for them as well. So Mr. Bear. Good evening. <clears throat> we had the good fortune of having three foreign exchange students with us this year. And we have two of the three that are here this evening. So if those two would please come up here at this point in time. And as they're working their way up, um, Nami is not here this evening. She is over at a concert. So when these two gentlemen get done, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, you want them to turn and face you guys or face the photographer? Or sideways. Along the table back here. Anyway. Um, when these two gentlemen get done, I will read what Nami has written. Nami wrote something and she wanted to be able to um, give you an idea of how well she's enjoyed her you're here at home in high school. So at this point in time, what I'll ask you two gentlemen to do is to introduce yourselves, your host families, and just give a little brief background about your year at home in high school. Thanks. All right, uh, my name is Lars. I'm from Norway. Uh, I've enjoyed my year here at home in high school, and especially doing sports in every season. Uh, started out with cross country, then swimming, and now I'm doing track. Uh, I met a lot of people that I'm going to miss when I'm, I leave. Um, and uh, my host family is in the back row. <laughs> <laughs> We've had a good time. Um, I think we'll have a good summer, too, before I leave. Um, yeah, I just want to thank you for having me, I guess, at Holman High School. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Hello. I'm Sung Won Song from South Korea. And I'm staying with Brunel family right there. And <laughs> I played two sports in this year. I played soccer. And I'm playing a tennis now. Um, I'm having a good time here. I will be missed in this this season in home in high school. Yeah. Thanks guys, but before you sit down, Miss Hancock has something to give you. I just popped up 
stuff on my Facebook, so it's um, amazing the connection. So <laughs> this is more folks because of our appreciation. I hope that both of you know that you've enriched the lives of our community by being here this year, and we really, really appreciate um, that you took, took the risk of coming to a small town like Loman. And I'm 50% Norwegian. See, I can make a connection. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so very much. Thank you. So perhaps a photo? <laughs> oh. Here we go. And I'm going to ask Mr. Baer to remain as he's going to actually go through the rest of the recognition for us this evening. Oh, Mr. Bear, I'm sorry, I interrupted. You were going to read? You know what, I, I can sit here and read it. That's okay. okay. <laughs> Before I go on to the rest of the recognition for some um, other events happening at Holman High School, I'd like to read what Nami has sent us. My name is Nami Kojima, and I am 17 years old. I came here as a Rotary Youth Exchange student from Japan. In Rotary Youth Exchange policy, we cannot pick a country, but I am so glad I got the USA because I love this country. So today, I want to talk about why I love this country and the wonderful experiences that I have had in the USA. From when I came here to after winter break, I stayed with my first, my first host family and had a wonderful time with them. They helped me with my English a lot. They took me to some places, especially the Florida trip, was really fun. <laughs> they treated me like one of their own family members. Now I am staying with a second host family, and I'm having a good time with them also. They are also helping me a lot with school and other stuff. As my high school life, I really had f a fun time with show choir and the musical. To join show choir and musical were my huge dreams since I was little, because in Japan, we don't have those activities as school activities at all. So my two dreams came true in the USA. Also through Rotary Youth Exchange Program, I met many <coughs> exchange students from all over the world, and I went to hockey games in Madison, Chicago, and Hawaii with them, and did lots of things together. So this young lady has been all over. <laughs> when someone asked me what is your favorite part in the USA, I say people. People here are so friendly and I love it. In Japan we do not talk with strangers or other random people, but here it's different. When I went to the mall with my host family, a woman who I don't know told how she likes my outfits. At first I was surprised and thought it's kind of crazy to talk to a stranger, but now I like it. I like friendly people. My exchange year is going, going really well, and I think it was because of people who are supporting me, such as my host families, my family in Japan, the Rotary, teachers, and friends. I still have two months and a half left. During that time, I want to experience more things, and I want to go back to Japan with tons of wonderful memories. Thank you, Nami. <laughs> We've had um, a pretty interesting month at the high school, and we, I felt like I needed to recognize three individuals that are either um, employees of the high school or um, community members. The first one is Sarah Halverson. Sarah is our family and consumer ed teacher. Sarah has been selected as a master advisor <coughs> of family, career, and community leaders of America for accomplishments such as an FCCLA advisor, and that is our youth group for family and consumer ed. Sarah will be recognized at the 2015 National Leadership Conference in Washington, D.C., and is one of 110 recipients who will be honored at the advisor recognition session on Thursday, July 9th. We at Holman High School are so grateful for Sarah's commitment to our program and students. In a very short period of time, Sarah has taken a struggling program and turned it into an extremely successful program. Thank you, Sarah. Mark Provisky. Mark is the manager at um, Festival Foods here in Holman. 
Our Holman High School show choir had a chance to go to Orlando, Florida to perform and receive some vocal and performance lessons back in April. Their original flight was scheduled to leave fairly early on a Sunday. This flight was canceled and they could not get another flight out until Monday night at 7.30 p.m. And that happened to be a night of a board meeting. And if you remember, I kept leaving the board meeting and went outside. <coughs> this flight was also then canceled. Their next scheduled flight out was then Tuesday at 7.30 p.m. They did not arrive back in the Twin Cities until after midnight. Because of their struggles, Mark from Home and Festival Foods was kind enough to donate cookies, pop, water, and sandwiches for the bus ride home from the Twin Cities. Thank you, Mark. And I went and I picked up the coolers. Not much left. <laughs> And finally, Christy Johnson. Christy is a business ed instructor at Holman High School. Ms. Christy Johnson applied for a technology-related grant from CenturyLink earlier in the school year and has been fortunate not enough to receive this grant. The grant is for a little less than $5,000 and we used for remodeling one of the business education labs in order to make it a more up-to-date, user-friendly, and collaborative learning environment. Ms. Johnson would like to transform her classroom into a learning environment called Makerspace. A Makerspace is a physical location where people gather to share resources and knowledge and work on projects, network, and build. Makerspace provides tools and space in a community environment, such as a library, community center, private organization, or school buildings. Expert advisors may be available some of the time, but often novices get help from other users. The makerspace, sometimes referred to as a hacker space, is often associated with fields such as engineering, computer science, and graphic design. The concept emerges from the technology-driven maker culture associated with Make Magazine and the maker fairs it promotes. This idea of a collaborative studio space for creative endeavors is called Hold in Education, where the informal combination of lab, shop and conference room form a compelling, compelling argument for learning through hands-on exploration. On campus, the makerspace is being embraced by the arts as well as the sciences, and a new energy is building around this collaborative effort. Thank you and great job, Christy. Christy received this check last Thursday at about 1.30 in the afternoon, and she, had, she, did, she thought she was not getting the grant, and they would not they told me not to tell her, so we walked into her classroom while she was teaching, and she was wondering why her three administrators were walking into her classroom. <laughs> but she did a great job with the grant, and she's, gonna, she's already started um, the groundwork for getting this project moving forward. So thank you to Sarah, Mark, and Christy. Thanks, Bob, for sharing those recognitions. <laughs> And I, I just say I was just going to make an announcement. Um, our exchange students, feel free to head out and <laughs> and, uh, and host families. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. And uh, before we introduce the next, I oh, I'm sorry. I think we're ready to move on. Well, I was just going to say, as I do with um, recognition and thank you as the host families, um, we really are. Um, thankful for their participation in bringing in those young people and having them be safe and secure as they're here. And again, as you see under recognition and thank you, it's individuals and organizations that make Holman unique. And um, we're very proud of our district and all those folks help to um, make the district what it is. And so thank you on behalf of the board. And then reports and discussion. Thank you. And um, also mentioned to our students who are here to present and any guests when you're done. It certainly you can feel welcome to stay with us for the night or if you have homework and things like that, it's certainly acceptable for you to head out as well. So with that, we have both, uh, we have representatives from both our middle school and our high school where annually we come, or they come to the board and give a report out on the year. So welcome, and if you just come up to the side table, Uh, 
Um, so I'm Caitlin Clausen. I'm a sixth grade math teacher at Holman Middle School. I'm also the student council advisor. And I came with three of my four officers today. Um, so Devin Reeves is our president. I have Madison Twitchell, our vice president. Ava Justice is our historian, but she couldn't make it tonight. And Braden Nissen is our social secretary. And I'm gonna let them kind of tell you about everything we've done this year. So for registration and open house, before school even started, the officers and some former members started promoting student council and encouraging all the kids to apply. We had a table at both registration days and both open house days. We also had student council members volunteer registration days to help with the school pictures, and so we love to volunteer. Our us. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Maddie. <laughs> Our awesome student council, the HMS student council is excited to announce we had 50 students who represented the student body and the community this year. Students have to apply by answering 10 questions about how they display the Viking values and get three recommendations from family members, friends, teachers. Okay, so for HMS fundraisers. Um, student council helps out the Holman Middle School parent teacher group with the middle school fundraiser. This year, we raised approximately $14,000. In addition to the kickoff assembly, student council members love to help during the delivery day. We unload the delivery truck, open the boxes, and sort all of the deliveries into groups per student. We also promote, find chaperones for, set up and clean up, and of course, celebrate at the green and gold dance. Money raised from our fundraiser goes, goes towards purchases to help our school, like staff grants and technology requests, just to name a few. We funded some staff grants this year. Some of our favorites included a green screen kit for the art room, some paperback and audiobooks for classrooms, supplies for the Harry Potter movie marathon, funding for student field trips, and NHD registration fees for the students traveling to nationals. So for Homecoming 2014, the HMS Student Council sponsored a week of dress up days to celebrate homecoming. This year we wore pajamas on Monday, a favorite of students and staff. Tuesday was look-alike day, Wednesday was wacky Wednesday, Thursday was neon day, and we ended the week with a Viking spirit day on Friday. So the student council members, <laughs> <laughs> so the student council members, we opened doors for uh, parent-teacher conferences and we greeted them. We also showed the staff our appreciation for their hard work by providing them dinner. So for the fall retreat on Friday, November 21st, 2014, the HMS Student Council took a field trip to the Town Hall of Holland for a day full of new experiences and a day of fun. The day included a chance for people and student council to grow their leadership skills, team building skills, and setting personal goals. The morning was spent with Mr. Egriches and Mr. Lua from Holman High School working through many fun team building activities. The student council members were able to work together to accomplish goals that required good communication and teamwork. The afternoon was spent with Mrs. Clausen and Ms. Johnson continuing our, our growth of leadership skills and setting community service projects for the year. The day wrapped up with goal setting. So for our Veterans Day Assembly, we were honored to welcome Sergeant Jack Calander as our guest speaker. Sergeant Calander, a father to three boys in our district, has served for the U.S. military and spent time touring around Europe. He gave an inspiring speech on his service and what it means to serve. The students were really moved by his words and took to heart what he was saying about freedom. We made 27 pies and we donated them to the Lacrosse Community Dinner over Thanksgiving. So for dances, in February, Student Council sponsored a Beat the Winter Blues Week. During this week, students and staff are once again encouraged to dress up. Monday was Disney Day. Tuesdays was 50s Day. Wednesday, the students faced off in a hippie versus hipster day. Thursday was an 80s day, and Friday was our favorite, pajama day. Friday's pajama day led into a glow-in-the-dark pajama party for 7th and 8th graders. And in April, Student Council sponsored a black and white dance for the 6th and 7th graders. So for our community service projects, um, our student council leads four different community service initiatives. Each officer selects a project and then puts it into action. These projects are entirely student led. The officers do all the planning, organizing, and promoting. Okay, 
So um, my community service group wrote letters to our, our troops serving in Afghanistan. Every person in my group wrote a letter describing some things about themselves, asking some questions in hopes of a response, and expressing their gratitude. All letters were sent to the same address to be distributed randomly there. For my community service project, me and a group of students attended three daycares. We visited one on April 29th, and that was Little Minds Learning Center over near the post office. Then we, last Wednesday we went to, on May 6th, we went to Children's Palace, and next week on Wednesday we are visiting Child First, and we just play with the kids and have fun with them, hopefully getting to know some of the kids in the community. So. That's my community service project. And then for Ava's community service project, I helped out with her bingo night for charity. The group planned a night for students and families, and the, do the money donated was do donated to Kids Care, which one of the students has started, and she raised a lot of money from that. And then I walked to Evergreen Elementary, and we read to a group of second graders, which they loved. Um, we still have fifth grade tours coming up. So what we basically do is we show them around the building and tell them where everything is, describe what some of the rooms are and how things work. We answer a lot of questions. It's kind of interesting, some of the questions that you get from the fifth graders. And we also get the chance to offer some advice. So, so for our staff luncheon, we're doing East Meets West. The Student Council loves to appreciate our fabulous teachers at the middle school. Like in past years, we are hosting a staff luncheon to show how much we love our teachers. We are using two local businesses to cater for this event. Then also, I'm going to do another community service project. We're going to host a school supply drive to collect supplies that usually are thrown away at the end of the year, so they can be used for next year. And then we also have our end of the year trip and elections coming up. Being in student council is hard work, whether it's baking cookies for staff, staying late to help set up for a dance, or being a good role model for the committee. Our council does it all. The end of the year trip is a chance to celebrate our accomplishments this year and plan for the year ahead. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank you. I know we call the middle school um, student council the fundraising machine. <laughs> 14,000 is great. And congratulations on all of the other efforts. I kind of wonder who won, the hippies or the hipsters? I would say the hipsters won. Okay. Oh. <laughs> we had a lot of explaining to do about it. Okay. <laughs> The, the, the amount of um, projects you take on is really impressive. I work in a middle school, and I love my middle school, and their student council is wonderful, but they don't do half the things you do. You really should be proud of yourselves. Yep. That's awesome. Just mind-blowing. You guys do a great job. Yeah, I'm not sure how the high school is going to top that. <laughs> <laughs> You're on. You don't even have a fancy presentation or anything. <laughs> um, um, my name is Becca Rush. I am the current president at the um, Holman High School Student Council. Um, it's a very busy time for everyone in the high school, especially seniors. So I'll make this a little brief and just give you an overview of what we did this year. Um, we start by having a meeting in August where we invite any students who had participated last year or who are interested in participating um, next year to come and start planning homecoming right away. That's our big event of the year. Um, we like to keep our enrollment in student council very flexible. We want to offer students to participate in any projects that they want, to kind of come and go as they please, and just allow them to get involved in things that they choose to. So um, it's just kind of a little bit different than maybe the, what the middle school does, but it's worked well for us. Um, so we, like I said, we start off with homecoming. This year we had the theme Empire State of Mind, which was inspired by our Empire Stadium. 
um, we kind of went for like a New York theme. And so student council, <coughs> we had a hidden immunity idol at school. We had the dress up days. We had um, class games during lunch, trying to boost um, school spirit. And then this year we had a record number of attendees at our dance. So a very successful homecoming for student council. Um, and then moving on in the year, in the winter, we always sponsor a family for the Giving Tree. So um, some of our students went and shopped for that family and wrapped the presents, you know, with character because we were not very good at that, but um, which is really great to be able to give back to them. And then more towards the spring, we have our annual blood drive, which was very success successful this year. We actually reached our goal, and so we will get $1,000 in scho scholarship money um, for seniors this year from the American Red Cross. So that was really exciting for us. Sometimes we don't quite make our goal, so that was really great. Um, I think it was 89 pints of blood that were donated, so that was um, very impressive for us. And then also Student Council itself sponsors three different scholarships um, for outgoing seniors. So we'll be able to give a lot of scholarships away this year, and that's something that we um, are really glad we're able to do. Um, and then also towards the end of the year this year, we are um, participating in some staff appreciation. So our students have been attending um, staff meetings at each of the schools and just giving them a little bit of our memories that we've had at that school, providing them with a little treat, and just thanking them for all of their work. Um, so it's kind of fun to go back and see your teachers and your old stomping grounds and just to thank everyone for um, what they've done for you. So that's how we're wrapping up our year. It's been a great one, and um, thank you for your continued support. Well, thank you, Becca. Very impressive as well. It's always <laughs> fun to hear what you do, and um, congratulations. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. You know, I think I come back here all the time, and you're probably sick of me like a broken or old penny. But the communication is really needed because today in the lunch line, I heard kids say, "Did you see the new roundabout they're building in front of the high school?" <laughs> Oh. <laughs> anyway, thank. Anyway, thank you. Um, I'm going to run a little thing here too. I yep. think, but again, I'm Lori Kessler, one of the counselors at the high school, and I have been in front of you many, many times talking about the community center project that started as a dream for a place for our kids to go after school because we know that they need it so desperately in this community that's growing so quickly and we have no place for them to go after school and in the evenings when we know that is the most critical time for at-risk behavior. So a few years back we, we set out to, to do this and then along the way this project morphed into a just not from a youth uh, center but to a community center and you'll know that Dan McHugh and Mary Lynn Wershoven and now quite a few people have joined the ranks and Last year we were a little disappointed because our votes, the first project for those of you who weren't here before was an addition to the high school that was going to be owned by the municipalities together and the votes failed and we were a little set back. But now we have new life because the town of Holland, so bless your heart if you live in the town of Holland, voted to do, make good on their commitment and so they took the money that they were going to, that their voters set aside and went into negotiations all last summer with the Diocese of La Crosse and St. Elizabeth's Parish and they purchased land that is just, I don't know if it's a block from the high school, between high school and middle school, we couldn't have picked a more perfect location for our kids to go. So we now have debt-free land that we, that now holds a sign that says future home of the Holman Area Community Center. So we did a kickoff at the Holman Area Foundation breakfast and we need to raise $4.2 million and um, we are on the way. We, we just, I came from a meeting from there earlier and it's been very interesting because um, to just this week, I've gotten a call from Bethany St. Joe, would you like to partner? Some company wants to do Jean's Day. Another woman would like to do one of the rooms in a memorial for her husband. So things are happening and we're, we're getting that move forward. One of a, a great thing, and I'm gonna find it here, I hope, because I'm not very good at this. We, I had an um, email over Christmas break. From, can I put this up there? Okay. Yep. 
happening. Anyway, I had an email that kept coming back over Christmas break, and I thought, who is this person? I, put, I thought it was spam, so I kept put, moving it away. Finally, the gentleman called me, and it was a company in West Salem called Identity Works, and they are just awesome, and they volunteered their time for us. They chose one philanthropic project per year. They chose our center, and they decided to do a rebranding for us. Let's start fresh. So you'll see this is the logo that they designed, young and old together, sort of celebratory. <laughs> Yay, we're here. This is good. And so they also did a, um, a tagline for us that says people, place, and purpose, and they designed this website for us, which is awesome. You can see a lot about, a lot of testimonials. You'll see here, if I can get this going. Oh, it's really slow. Um, oh, there I am. I didn't know that. Shoot. I don't, <laughs> want, I don't want that. But here's our brochure. I think you got a copy of that. Oh, we have to, what do we do now? Run the plug-in. Okay. So this is a copy of the brochure, and it gives you, the, I was going to show you the floor plan um, that the people can see in the big part, but you see lots of home and people. Here's the location, Mokey Road High School, little neighborhood. There we are. Perfect walking distance to, from those. Um, uh, you'll see a bigger floor, floor plan later on, but there's a gymnasium with a walking track, um, a teen center with the technology, community room, multi-purpose rooms, and the, the school district of Holman has offered to partner with us in the past, and we, Cheryl, reaffirmed that at the foundation breakfast. We're looking for ways that the school district can use this building during the day before the kids come in the afternoon or any way that you can think is possible because the more it's the spirit of the the whole thing collaborating together working together connecting generations is really what it's all about so please take a look at the website if you can there's a I gotta, I gotta find the part that has like there's a part that connects it to all these different daily bops and I gotta show you I think um, I don't know if this is it or not but there's a place where it connect oh, that's not it anyway you can like take a virtual tour but you also can connect mm -hmm. to Facebook and maybe this is it I should know this, but I don't. Ah. Anyway, right over here. Facebook, Twitter, uh, whatever, whatever, whatever. Those things did mail, so, Pinterest. So, so get and on there, the spread one. the word, send it to people, LinkedIn, all those things. Mm -hmm. So what we're looking for you is to spread the word. Um, think about ways, that we're going to the different schools too to talk about ways that we can work together. But anyway, we're alive and well, happy to be here, and we sure appreciate your support all along the way. So any way you can think we can work together, let me know. Thank I'll you. I'll be back for Questions, are there any questions? Um, I just want to say that I think Lori is like <coughs> the, Bad in all capital letters, the energizer bunny of any project <laughs> that you've taken on. We'll um, see. I so appreciate. Thank um, you your positive attitude even after the kind of defeat and well, then that I, was like I pass this on because um, Dan, I don't know if you know Dan McHugh but he, yes. I said oh I'm kind of mad about this and he said you have one hour get over it and we're on our way I love it so I love it too because it's really true get over it move on yes. and there we go so and please thank um, Mary Lynn as well um, both of you have been incredible I know that some many of the meetings I can't make but I'll be there. Oh, I'll get there eventually. We're all good. Um, but thank you. Thank you for all this you're extra welcome. work. And you're not getting paid with anything except love, right? It'll be good when it's done. All so. right. Okay. So any questions? I know you mentioned partnerships, and we've done a little bit of brainstorming. We've talked something, okay. probably okay. the Buildings and Grounds Committee. You know, as we review our contracts for 4K, as we look at growth <coughs> needs, as we look at the, you know, the building out on the prairie that we have, certainly um, there may be some things in the future that we may right. need, and those are some of the things that we've kind of pushed around there from time to time. But it's going to be a great we'll be walking distance for both the middle school and the high school students to go to afterward so it's a great resource for them even in the winter time it's right. close enough to right. be to be close enough so All right. okay thank you thank you and then um, let's see resolution regarding the local government property insurance Julie good evening good evening you have before you the issue paper um, regarding the withdrawal from the local government property insurance fund. You may have heard that the governor had proposed in his biennium budget to dissolve the local government property insurance fund. Um, the finance committee has affirmed that decision and so the office of commissioner and their management has sent out letters moving forward um, with the assumption that that will happen. 
And soon after we, we received that letter, we, ha we received our renewal quote for July 1st, which increased 129% over our 1415 premium <coughs> and so attached to the issue paper is the um, withdrawal form to position the district to accept other carriers we are currently in the process of seeking quotes um, to replace that coverage July 1st but in order to position us and to withdraw according to the regulation I recommend that this be approved at the next board meeting so we can move forward so are there questions Thank you, Julie. Thank you. And the next item, um, Melissa. Melissa. Uh -huh. Employee handbook language. Okay. So we have five items tonight on the um, agenda to review for handbook changes. Again, these have all gone through um, the Personnel and Governance Committee, the Employee Relations Team, and um, changes have been made up to that point. And now we're here for board uh, presentation and consent at the next meeting. Um, the first two items you'll notice um, the first item is paid leave this falls under the provision for all staff um, it talks about earning paid leave and then unpaid leave um, these items came up um, in the fall of the year we had some new employees um, who were not eligible for family medical leave so we um, had to make some changes to help accommodate um, some concerns that those employees had not being able to utilize all of their paid leave. So um, the language under paid leave changes. The big change under that one is um, annually allocating their leave versus crediting their leave at the beginning of the year. So um, a credit will be now giving them all of their leave at the beginning of the year versus just a credit of it based on them working the full year. Um, there's also some additional changes in there to remove some older language that we no longer utilize um, that can be deleted out. The rationale under the unpaid leave under section 14 um, is exactly the same as it is under the paid leave. Um, and this all again falls under that um, issue of employees not being eligible for family medical leave. The change under the unpaid leave includes making an adjustment at the end of the year if an employee um, is not eligible for certain types of benefits um, throughout the year based on that ineligibility of family medical leave. Um, the third item kind of falls in along with these other two items. This came up. Um, this was part of the solution um, for that ineligibility for family medical leave for some employees. So we've left our qualifying medical event language under the donation of leave policy um, or language in the handbook and also added a section that allows recently hired employees um, to qualify for a donation of leave from other employees in the event that they don't have enough leave to um, be paid for their entire absence. Um, the next item or language item is under part three, um, flexible schedule. This is for hourly employees. Um, the recommendation is just to remove the sunset language under this provision. Um, you may recall that this sunset was added because of the early release that we have. And as that continues to be incorporated every year into our calendar, the recommendation is to just eliminate that sunset language and continue on with the flex language that we have. Um, the last item then is really just something that falls under, well, this is the supervisory and administrative section, um, the post-employment benefits for that group. This is um, something that we have to change due to a rule change under the employee trust fund. So um, eliminating that 10 days of work for a, as a requirement for an administrator who retires um, from the district. Any questions? So, as Melissa alluded to, these items have gone to <coughs> personal and governance. So I, 
through the employee relations team as well, probably with the, a little bit of the exception of the last one relating to personal and governance, but this has actually come to the attention of the board in the past on the removal of the 10 days. So, um, and these would be on consent at the next board meeting. Yep. So questions. Are there any questions? Thank you, and thank you for all the work you did in moving these through. I know last year, well, at the beginning of the year last year, there was some really tense moments and people wanting to make sure our employees were treated well, and mm -hmm. we really appreciate your response um, to that and um, working with the Personnel and Governance Committee to making sure that those uh, things were responded to. You know, it, you don't want to have those unintended consequences occur mm -hmm. from making changes, and I really felt that our, I think we did a stopgap for this year to, um, react in such a manner and then these will make permanent some of those changes and then also incorporate some other things so thank you I think these will make good changes so yes. thanks thank you and as indicated those will come before the board at the next uh, board meeting so the next item is the help desk position uh jan we and dr carlson i have i think we'll just um unless you have <coughs> questions i'm going to talk a little bit about it and then jan can help out if necessary but this position is in response to our one-to-one -one initiative, specifically to, uh, as a result of the successful referendum. This position has been part of that planning, and it really is, a, it's a, the title, a help desk and system support. And um, again, this would be, has been part of our plan um, to implement and would be funded. The funding source is out of the, the technology referendum dollars. I want to be clear that, um, again, this has been part of that plan, and so that this particular staffing piece is uh, out of that, out of the referendum dollars, and just so as time goes on, um, everybody's very clear on that. There is, um, there is a request tonight. We have this also on the consent agenda, and it, again, um, it'd be ultimately to, up to the board if you're comfortable with that, but it is something that, we feel we have communicated in different ways, but we want to, we're anxious to get going on this and to assist us as July 1 approaches and we get uh, hopefully in full swing soon of, of really planning the implementation, especially at our middle school for our next year. So this is really on that technical side to really assist our <laughs> staff and students and with that implementation and then that ongoing maintenance um, and support. Um, so, otherwise, it is on the consent tonight. If you have questions right now, be happy to respond. And if I can't, I know Jan is there to help out as well. Any questions? I guess my question, and I think I've asked that, what happens in four years when the reven referendum dollars? We've talked about that. Uh, it, is, it, it would be four years out. That would have to be a decision ultimately at that time that the district will have to make. I think it's enough time that, again, we're going to just have to post and move forward. And it's just, it'll, it'll be a staffing position that the board at that time will have to address. Okay. Okay. And the staffing plan okay. update high school changes. Also, this is on your consent as well tonight. Um, as part of the, this is a change, just a, a minor change I would like to, uh, since I presented the staffing plan on April 27th with the board, there was a correction in two areas. A correction, first of all, in English language arts. If you look back to that plan, there was technically, from a budget um, standpoint, a 0.83 FTE increase. And part of that had to do with current overload assignments and so on, and when you work your way through that, it really resulted in a 0.83 increase. We since, after going back through that, we've discovered that because of the difference in some of the funding sources that are applied, this budget-wise would really be reflected as a 1.0, not a 0.83. So the effect is a 0.13 addition to what the staffing plan uh, was originally presented. And so, um, and I put the cost difference of about $12,500. The second piece is related to uh, the change would occur within our social studies department. And again, if you look back to the original staffing plan, 
um, you showed actually a reduction in the area of social studies. However, as we've worked through, as Mr. Bear and the staff have worked through the scheduling process, and this, is, this happens, it's not unusual, to really to reduce, and I know Ms. Kessler's back there, she would know very well, to help reduce the number of conflicts through that scheduling process. This is meant to help that, and, and we can even be more specific. I think this might help um, even more so in a specific area of music and band. And as that enrollment has increased and continues to grow, this, again, these type of things happen to help out the scheduling process and to minimize the conflicts, the scheduling conflicts for students. So as a result, this is, um, since that original plan that you approved, this is a change of about 0.33 FTE. And it's not, I want to be clear, it's a little different than um, those increases generally are in the general classroom at the high school level it's, it, and elsewhere. It's not necessarily student enrollment driven in social studies, but it's student enrollment driven in other areas, and in this case, even more so in music that has resulted in this. So I know I was going to take a crack at this. Uh, Mr. Bear, I don't know if you have anything to add, and I won't, take, I won't put Ms. Kessler on the spot because that wasn't planned at all, but <laughs> have I hit the, the main parts to that? And so... Um, Any questions on that? So th this is on the consent. Mr. Menninger. Um, I, I do have a question, and, it, and it's related to this, but it, it's, it's not directly, but it, it kind of touches on it when you talk about some of the scheduling conflicts. Um, I, I continue from time to time, and it seems to creep up a little bit more towards the end of the school year, uh, questions around block scheduling and its effects on education, and, and I myself continue to have questions around it. I, I think has the practice shown that it is actually advantageous to student learning? I know those periods are very long. It's tough to keep kids' attention, um, and, it, and it does have some challenges with some of the other programs, band and, and uh, choir and things like that. And has there been any look at recently or any discussion around revisiting or reviewing the whole concept of block scheduling at the high school? Um, I'm not, I'm, I don't think I can say that there has been recently, Mr. Menninger. Um, Mr. Bear? You, no. Um, I don't know if we could get a microphone to you or if you'd like to just come on up front. Sorry to put you on the spot, Mr. Bear. <laughs> no, we I really have not looked at an overall change. One of the things we did about three years ago was to um, put in skinny language nines and algebra ones to give those kids a better foundation as they move forward. Um, so we have not looked at overall changing the schedule in those regards. Um, I'll just tell you right now, there is no perfect schedule. I think what you have to do as a building or as a community is realize what works best for your community and your kids and, and um, try to make your schedule work the best you can for you, the needs of your kids, whether it's a block schedule, a modified block, a seven period day, an eight period day. Um, so there hasn't been a lot of research done on it in regards to changing overall. I, I can tell you though that if we were to change from what we presently have to an eight period day, it would probably cost you some money because now you have textbooks that you can use one semester for one group of kids and then the next semester for another group of kids. So you double your need for textbooks in some areas and you would probably also look at um, the, an increase in staffing <coughs> because of those same, some of those same scenarios. I know this is a little off topic, but it's, it's, you've heard me often. Yeah, you threw me a curveball, Tim. <laughs> yeah, you've often heard me talk about year round schooling and, and, and my you know support of that as well. I would probably assume that would cost us more money too. And you know when I look at the student learning and knowing that in a block scheduling, somebody may not take math in the fall of one year and may not take it again until the spring of 
almost two years later, that's really a long learning gap. And if I'm worried about the three months in the summer, that that really would would cause some of that. And I just you know looking at even here, you know, point number two is somewhat influenced, I think, by block scheduling, as you know we have to look at some of the staffing needs to accommodate that with on the agenda tonight. So. I'll, I'll throw in my two cents worth on that too, since you've given me an opportunity <laughs> to sit in front of the mic. Um, and I think you and I have had this conversation and our present schedule is, is not, I don't think, efficient for what we need to do for kids this day and age. And, and I think when Dale and the consortium went to the DPI a couple of years ago and asked for a different schedule, I think that was a better move. In, in that direction than what we presently have because our present schedule as you all know is it's an ag schedule it's an ag calendar and that's not meeting the needs of our kids at this point in time and we need to look at an extended school year and Thank it's you. a fair question on the block versus more of a seven or eight period day or some kind of flex month schedule but I in this case I, I still don't think it would be unusual even if you were on a seven or eight period schedule where whenever you have a very large singleton such as band, it, it, creates, it creates challenges. So I, I, I certainly can't sit here tonight and say it's specific that block schedule is driving this. Um, I, from my past experience elsewhere, <laughs> other schedules, we would have similar challenges. So, but thank you for the question. You know, it's one last thing and then then i'll leave um it's it's a problem that we have because of a positive our band numbers have gone from 90 kids to 130 kids so we're having a conflict because of a pro positive problem so if we can look at it in that manner that's a good way to look at it so okay anything else i think that's it thank, thank you, you. So then moving on to SaluCare um, Occupational Therapy contract. Good evening. Good evening. Um, every year at this time I come before you to talk about the Occupational Therapy contract. Um, I just have a couple things that I want to say about that, a couple of reminders for you. Um, occupational therapy is a service that we are required to provide to our students with disabilities who are eligible for occupational therapy. Um, and so we have contracted with Salucare Rehabilitative Service for many years and we have a really long standing good relationship with them. Um, so I am looking to continue that contract. Um, I worked really hard with them this spring to come up with a contract that was doable and not a huge increase. So the contract numbers that you see on the issue paper reflect less than a 1% increase um, for this service um, for this next year. I did opt to keep this a one-year contract. I think it's good to revisit it every year, um, to revisit the number of students in receiving the service and um, what our needs are every year. So I'm opting to keep that uh, and recommending that we keep it a one-year um, contract. This is not on the consent agenda tonight, but it will be on at the next meeting. So um, I would answer <coughs> any questions you might have. Are there any questions? Thank you, Julie. And then the next item is the staffing plan, other building and district positions, Dr. Carlson. We're just going to make some switches here. Just be patient, please. Well, as part of the 2015-16 staffing plan, administration um, 
is recommending the positions of school information system specialist and the assessment and data coordinator. The board had asked to uh, asked, had asked for some additional information. Our purpose tonight is to respond to questions submitted by the board uh, back at the last board meeting, and we've been working on that. Hopefully, um, again in the board packet, uh, we've we've actually made some revisions since since then and including the slide on the comparable data so um, but it should be on your Dropbox and I think we put a copy a paper copy of the multi slides for you to follow along as well before we begin to um, address uh, your questions I did want to clarify that these positions are not administrator positions as mentioned in the courier life <coughs> information system specialist is a designed to be an hourly position and the assessment and data coordinator is a teacher contract position similar to our existing coordinator uh, contracts that we already have in place data is increasingly important to our systems throughout our organization and is aligned with our district vision of educating every student to achieve global success in order to achieve our vision and commit to our core values, data needs to be accurate, valid, accessible, and meaningful. The access of data, use of data, understanding of data impacts our students, our parents, our teachers, truly impacts all of us. Our core values make a commitment to data-driven decision-making. We have an opportunity to enhance our capacity in making decisions based on data that will prepare students for a successful future, create informed system-wide decisions that impact stakeholders, enable us to implement innovative programs and services, and really engage in responsible actions to that ultimately impacts our students and student learning. Good evening. We are going to share a bit about the differences between the two positions and their major responsibilities. <coughs> this list is not all-inclusive, but an overview of each position. Two of the important responsibilities of the school information specialist is to provide support for staff and students and parents, and also systems alignment district-wide. An example would be we have um, often receive um, requests for support from parents for their accounts to ask for their good numbers and to get uh, some technical assistance <coughs> and the only assistance that they receive right now is really web-based and via a help desk email account so sometimes it takes 24 to 36 hours to get a uh, turnaround on their requests the position would provide timely um, resolution to those issues and additionally the position will also help align our processes and our, our um, procedures district-wide for the assessment and data coordinator this person would be able to provide professional development to educators administer, administrators and departments on data analysis to better use their data to help stakeholders and make informed decisions currently because of capacity, data for reports is not always available, or it takes a, a time to create the reports. Analysis to support is not always available, nor is time to collaborate about the true data needs, which results in a lot of redo or expanded and additional requests for data. Okay, on the school information system specialist side, um, we want to increase and ensure data efficiency and accuracy. Data must be consistent, and it must be set on a, uh, it must be based on a set of agreed upon rules. Right now, we have 11 different secretaries who are um, editing demographics and household data. That's just in that particular module. Um, we need to have the consistent kind of checks and balances to make sure our data is accurate. Having that dedicated school information system specialist will provide for that. So the assessment and data coordinator would be able to 
help or provide analysis and interpretation of results to educators and departments to help with their PDSAs or other data needs in order to create action steps in a timely manner based on the data. Both positions, you will notice on both sides of the slides, will need to work collaboratively together to ensure that the data is accurate, that there is documentation of process and procedures, and that consistent communication is given across both departments. This may be surprising, but um, with every school information system, there are constant updates and new features that are released almost on a monthly basis. Some of them are critical and some of them are minor. Uh, we've had 11 updates since um, July 1st of the school year. Uh, currently, we do not have the systems and structures in place to make sure that we properly communicate and implement those changes, and this position would assist with that. So different from that position, the assessment and data coordinator is not the nuts and bolts of how Infinite Campus works. It is more about creating and coordinating the methods to collect data and reports. Additionally, the position would work outside of Infinite Campus programs that are housed within the district, such as Skyward, or external databases that are housed outside the district, such as AmesWeb or MAP. And as the next slide indicates on the school information system side, um, we want to provide oversight and maintenance of our user accounts and rights. Presently, all user account creation, management, and right setting is done by myself. Um, while I believe it's a, a very critical priority, there are so many priorities um, that really the, a director needs to take care of. So uh, this position will make sure that those, those duties are taken care of. Uh, documenting procedures and processes is presently being done, but not at the level that we'd like to be, have in place, and that's an additional duty of the school information specialist. One of the major changes in education is that a majority of assessments are done online or have an online reporting system. This requires data collection from each of the individual systems and putting in a usable and consistent form our current system doesn't allow us the flexibility and accuracy of using data to the level that is necessary or requested. And currently, same, similar to Jan, a lot of the, I am serving as the liaison for Wise Dash Local. Again, I believe this is a priority so that we can move forward with our use of data in the district, but my plate is very full and I don't know if it should be a priority specifically of my position. Um, with state mandated testing, each assessment has its own rules, responsibilities set up and professional development for our educators. At this time, there are eight different state mandated assessments that, stand, that span pre-K 11 that I prepare for. One of the requests from the board was to look at comparable data and what do other districts have in regards to these positions. So um, I worked and did a survey. We sent out a survey to about 20 districts. We received 10 responses back. Um, from those 10 districts, the enrollment sizes ranged from about 2,400 kids to 4,400. So um, some higher than us, some lower than us, but in that general range of our enrollment size. Um, before I go on and just talk about those results, I just want to set that a reminder out there that when we look at this data, um, we were not able to fully see each district's organizational structure. So how that one district may be aligned is not necessarily going to match up with how our district is aligned organizationally. Um, additionally, I didn't review any of the job descriptions, so we don't have an apples to apples comparison. It's really just a generalized um, statement of do you have an, a student information system specialist so um, of those 10 districts um, all of them employ a student information system specialist which is the position under um, Jan or 
or the IT department. At a minimum, they employed a half-time person, a 0.5 full-time equivalency. Um, one district, however, um, or actually two districts, employed two full-time um, employees in that position. Um, and then seven out of those 10 districts also employ an assessment and data coordinator. So in terms of who is currently doing the work in, in our district, um, I think we've, we've already referenced uh, uh, to a degree that answer, but basically Wendy and I are doing uh, the majority of that work. Um, for both positions, there's much work which is not currently being done due to the lack of the time and opportunity um, to address those uh, needs. Uh, the, there are additional tasks that you heard about that are included in these job descriptions that ensure data integrity and will meet the needs of our stakeholders, both internal and external. So one of the questions you had is, why isn't the current setup working? Um, state mandates such as response to intervention, the specific learning disability rule, assessment standards, and educator effectiveness have taken a significant time to implement. In addition to implementation of the mandates, there are ongoing needs at, and work related to the mandates that continue now and into the future. And as we reflect on research-based instruction and continuous improvement, it's imperative that we utilize a deeper spectrum of data to guide our decisions, and this is linked to our core values. Our current data system is not of the highest validity and accuracy due to the capacity to address the needs within our current staffing levels. And this is another question that was forwarded to us. As we've referenced, the state mandates and capacity to implement them play a large role in our inability to offer the same level of support to our staff in the areas of curriculum, staff development, and assessment. By adding these two positions, it will allow us to regain the balance so that we can support our staff in meeting their needs and allowing our staff to meet the need, their student needs. Currently, our staff cannot access data outside of the district. By adding this position, staff members will have the capacity to maximize use and access data 24-7 in any location. One of the questions was, can we get by with one position rather than two? And as you've already heard, uh, part of our presentation up to this point, and as you examine the specific tasks and skills and responsibilities for each position and the different levels of skill sets and expertise required, we, we would continue to recommend that, um, that it is in the best interest of our organizational structure and our school district and for kids to ha have both positions and not just the one. Um, the board also forwarded a question regarding Wise Dash Local, and I thought to answer your question the best, I would need to briefly explain what Wise Dash Local is. So Wise Dash is currently a system, and I put a little graphic on here to kind of visually depict it. Wise Dash Public is accessible on the DPI website. It has very general assessment data, similar to what WINS had. The data is comprised of non-identifiable and aggregate data because it is open to the public. Wise Dash District is a secure portal and has more specific data about schools and students. And in this portal, it has state assessment data, attendance data, graduation data, and subgroup data for, for attendance assessment and graduation. The user for this is typically districts and continuous improvement teams. The difference in why the local is 
the larger part of the triangle is because it also is a secure portal that is controlled by our school district. Our school district is able to provide specific dashboards for any and all possible district data. We will be able to do financial data, food service data, human resource data, and a wide variety of student data from behavior to assessments. We are in need of someone with specific skills to make the bridge between all of our other systems, such as Infinite Campus and Skyward, into WiseDash. The district will own the data that is uploaded within WiseDash Local. <coughs> the Department of Public Instruction cannot access the data. And the user for WiseDash Local is local employees, such as department supervisors, administrators, and educators. So the question that you provided was, um, what do we pay for Wise Dash Local to track assessments? Again, Wise Dash Local has the ability to track more than just student assessments. This year, because we are in a setup year with them, we, I have paid uh, roughly $2,100 for this setup, which is prorated based on when we are onboarding with them and then annually after that is $17,335. So we just ask, can we streamline this entire process by repurposing current resources? We had shared, I shared with you that part of this overall plan would be actually to repurpose the current uh, instructional services 10 month position that has been left vacant for this school year. If, if both these positions were to be approved. Um, but these two positions, quite honestly, will enable us to streamline, in many ways, our processes as a school district. These positions, now it was already mentioned in the earlier slide that uh, Jan and Wendy do the majority and so much of this. They don't do it all. They don't do it all. So please know that these positions would help alleviate the increased amount of time teachers as well spent entering their own data, but not remove them totally from the process as they need to continue to be engaged in that effort. But as, these, as this continues, what, what will continue to happen is we will have to look at our teachers, for example, and, and others to continue to take more of this on. And this would help alleviate um, much of that. The effectiveness and efficiency will be enhanced in providing the necessary data, information, accurate systems that will continue to move this school district forward and, in op and, and uh, be able to reach its vision of educating every student to achieve global success. And so, as I mentioned uh, earlier, we would continue to recommend this. This is, I believe, uh, we believe, the right direction. Uh, we certainly understand the the reason for questions and the timing, and obviously, as some of you had stated previously. But um, at this point, if we would entertain some further questions, this is not, as you see, this is not on the consent agenda. Um, but we would be coming back. Our plan would be to bring this back for your consideration at the next board meeting on May 26th. But we will take questions and continue to follow up for you in any way we can as far as um, more information to help you out. So questions. Does anyone else want to go first? Or is it? Um, I, just, I have a couple questions. So um, how many, I, I know you mentioned that we do, I was trying to write fast, but there was a lot of data to write down. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> Did you say we do eight, eight state mandated assessments right now? So, and how many non mandated assessments do we do? It really depends by the grade level, but um, for example, I know we were looking at the assessment calendar, and our younger grades are less, but you know, for the entire school year, it is around 20 assessments, and that includes the state mandated assessments so within that eight of them are mandated and we do 12 that we don't need to do or we right do such as like our common writing assessments our common math assessments you know those type of assessments 
that we use our own internal data and Ames Web and Map. So. Okay. Sorry. Okay. And then, um, um, Melissa, when you mentioned that the the um, comparable data, you said that the seven districts employ a data coordinator. What FTE are those positions in the other? We did not ask the FTE on that position because they are salaried positions. So typically in a teacher role, it's a 1.0, but we looked mo mainly for the FTE on the hourly position. Oh. Okay. And then my other question, or maybe it's just more of a comment. I, I know you said that mainly the work is done by you and then Dale kind of towards the end you said, but not all the work is done and that the teachers do some of the work. That aren't, aren't there a couple of secretaries who do a lot of the work too? A lot of the inputting, a lot of the creation of the information that goes out to the teachers with the data. I'm, what will, or am I looking at this wrong? Am I not understanding this? So currently the data that is entered in the assessment database, I currently put it all in because it doesn't come out in an easy way. I put it all in Excel spreadsheets and share it with the teachers. So for example, when you see everybody's PDSAs, all those charts and graphs that are made are ones that I've created with the raw data that's been entered into the database. So they don't do any of that? They, what a teacher would do is they would enter currently their for example, I'll get, again use their common assessment data as far as like their common math assessment, their common writing assessment. They enter the data, but then I put it all together in a reportable form with the graphs and charts. That wasn't not the way I understood it, but okay. Any other questions? Kate? Would either these positions then, this is like a piggyback off of your question, would teachers be relieved of any of the data they have to put in? Because I know if we're doing, what do I see here? 20 different assessments. Of those 20, how many of those assessments do teachers at this point enter before you can write up the report, Wendy? Sure, just fine. And then I want to know if this position will change that or not, if they still have to put in all this data, because I, I know that a lot of their plan time is taken up with data, <laughs> and that's the nature of the beast now. I get that. But that's kind of a critical question for me. Who does it relieve? Right. So of the 20 assessments, again, the 20 assessments are across the year. So a number of them we give four times a year, or three times a year, like the writing assessment is given fall, winter, spring. Mm -hmm. The teachers currently enter their own student data for that. I, you know, I have not thought of this person entering that data for the entire district, partly because we're asking this person to have the computer programming background more than the data entry background, S you know, and when they also are working more than just student assessments, they're also working on food service, human resource data. Okay. I don't know if they're going to have time, quite honestly, to do that. So off the top of my head, and I may be wrong, they currently enter their Fontes and Pinnell data and, and this is just elementary. Our middle school and high school teachers do not enter any data within the database. So they enter their Fontes and Pinnell data, their math common assessment data, and their writing common assessment data. Um, the math and writing are three times a year, and Fontes and Pinnell are four times a year. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I'm just, I'm just going to reiterate here. This position will not alleviate teacher data entry, but it will alleviate the um, time it takes to get for 
others to put together all that data? Do I have that correct? Well, partly. I mean, when if you think back to when you were in a building, Kate and your PLCs, by the time everybody got all their data together and you put it in a usable form, you know, it's old data. It's not anything that's really helpful to take action on. So, I mean, when teachers under this system enter their data, they will have it immediately and be able to sit down with their PLC and say, how'd your kids do? What are you noticing? What behaviors, you know, or how did you get those results? Tell me about that so that you can borrow ideas that they may be used in their classroom. Thank you. Other questions? I have a quick question. Um, for Wendy, it seems like, you know, this is really going to help you out a lot with, with your position of not having to do all that, putting it all together for all those different systems and, and assessments. What do you want to do with your time? Or what would you ideally see your day looking like that you could really, you know, do the things that you need to do, want to do, mandated to do? What would that look like? So when I think about the mandates that I mentioned, yep. they are all new mandates within the last five years that have all fallen on instructional services. So I'm doing all of those mandates in addition to trying to keep a curriculum and cycle moving and staff development. So I think it, I've, you know, and I think Jan referenced it, I'm doing the best I can. I'm working a lot of hours, but I'm probably not supporting our staff the way that I did my first year in the position and in those aspects of my role. So you see yourself being able to be more available. Yes, most know, definitely. With supporting them, getting back to them, those kinds of things that yes. have, you haven't been able to do. Yeah, okay. I've been trying very hard. Yeah, but. right. I mean, there's only so much time. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I just, just a couple things. I'm curious about um, Infinite Campus that we utilize now. So are we moving with the $17,000 for um, Wise Dash? Are, does the Infinite Campus not provide a module so that we can keep that assessment data there? So it will be entered into Infinite Campus. What Wise Dash will do, they will bridge together so that the data will be able to be seen in a usable form. So currently, everything is entered into Access Database but not in a usable form where then I have to create the charts and graphs where now if they enter it into infinite campus there will be that bridge that will automatically go into wise dash where the educators will be able to manipulate the data and get the charts and graphs just by clicking on it so in order to do that we have to do the wise dash correct what are we paying for infinite campus I would think because I think that's pretty hefty I, annual I'm going to try and remember this. I think it's, uh, Julie, $7 per student. Is that right? Okay. And then also a hosting fee of about $10,000. So I believe it's around, I want to say 21000 and then add in the hosting fee. It just seems to me that we should be able to get that data without having to do that bridge, I mean, into Infinite Campus. And that, for some reason, having worked with databases, doesn't make sense and I you know some of the duties on the assessment and data coordinator importing data and serving as a liaison and those sorts of things um, creating and coordinating those systems those seem to I feel that those are things that the other position could do you know junk in junk out that's kind of I've always been under the belief that you want to have one person make making sure that you have those controls over a database otherwise if you've got more you know cooks in the kitchen kind of thing um, so I express it as a concern just from experience I don't know if it's a big enough concern to to um, but the the need for, to have computer programming I know you mentioned that and that uh, if we're using already developed and designed programs, databases. I'm not sure why we need to have a master's person with computer programming and maybe um, Wendy or Jan sure. could respond to that. And maybe Jan can better than I can, but it's going in through the backside of Infinite Campus and actually programming it so that the data can be entered 
into Infinite Campus, the assessment data. So we need someone who can go into that backside and do that, but then also while they're in the backside of Infinite Campus or Skyward or any of the other programs, be able to create that bridge so that they, they communicate ongoing, where right now, you know, I mentioned last time our access database is a standalone. They don't communicate, so it's, it's not ongoing. Which and who enters it into the access database now? You do or? Combination of educators, Brenda and I. And the access database is managed by? Brenda. 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 Any other questions? Okay. Well, as Dr. Carlson said, this is not on our um, consent agenda. We continue to have questions, and if you have any, please forward them on. Um, thank you for your presentation and information. Then, I'll wait for Dr. Carl. Are you coming back up here? Or? Yes, I am. Okay. Well, it is the, that time of year again, and Holman High School candidates for graduation are before us. 260. I think we even changed it by one just recently. Oh. So rather than 263, we're at 264. Oh, well, good, it went up. <laughs> as, of, <laughs> as of today. So uh, that's the right direction. This is on your consent agenda. We actually asked you to <coughs> part of the, that action, but um, look forward to a little bit over, well, not this weekend, but the following weekend. So, um, but uh, again, another group of students leaving our school district and just you know we mentioned this we'll mention this at graduation too but this is this isn't just an accomplishment uh, by these students uh, as far as what our high school staff has done and supported them this is really coming together as a school district and and even those that were in our early childhood program and so 13 plus years and so it's uh, always a culmination of an effort of so many and um, but with that, you have this on your consent and look forward to May 23rd. All right, wonderful. And then graduation date. Yes, I believe, again, we're going to, <coughs> we're going to maintain, or the recommendation is to maintain the Memorial Weekend. And so you have that date, it looks like May 28th. But that, so it's a little later. Uh, this year, Memorial uh, Day is early. And so uh, we would be, uh, planning that which has been a tradition for some time to have it on the Memorial Weekend which has seemed to work out pretty well for families and and so on and that isn't on our consent but correct I don't think it is I think we have just set that yeah. um, administratively on that but just to inform the board okay thank you so then we are to consent agenda um, items are there any items that you would like to consider separately um, I would like to pull out the personnel report. Okay, are there any other items to consider separately? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda items with the omission of the personnel report, which is item 10.1. There's a motion, is there a second? I'll second. Discussion? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor of approving the consent agenda items as presented, with the exception of item 10.1, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. And um, the personnel report item 10.1, Dr. Carlson, I know that you wanted to make a couple comments. Make a, a mention. I uh, always like to celebrate and recognize those who are looking at retiring. And so there are two people on your personnel report this evening. That you'll be approving and one is Karen Sieben who uh, we have it down for has served the district for nine years as an educational assistant and so we thank Karen for her service over this time and obviously impacting so many kids um, throughout her time here also we have a name that is very familiar Jan Wee and so Jan is completing this time this is her eighth year in the school district um, and we we just uh, we're gonna have other opportunities to thank Jan as well but talk about a person who has impacted so many lives 
in the school district in so many different ways. And so um, we are looking at, I think, the kind of an August date. And so um, it'll be, uh, I think, in, in many ways, a real positive uh, help to transition. And we have a number of things that are happening uh, in the area of technology. And so, uh, but Jan, I, I know uh, so many people appreciate what you've done over this time. And on a personal note, that includes me and, and how you've helped me over this time and uh, the work we've done and what you've taught me so much about, about instructional technology. And I, I appreciate it so much. So thank you. So those were a couple of retirement notices. And I think you have. Well, I just also wanted to note that in our personnel report this evening, we are confirming um, the appointment of Dr. Chris Mueller as our new district administrator. And she is here this evening and just wanted to recognize her and welcome her to the district and make a special note of that being part of the um, consent ag agenda item in personnel report. So with having that be, um, been said, if someone would like to move to approve the personnel report as presented. I'd like to pull out the Jan we oh. <laughs> um, um, I agree. But I won't. I'd make a motion to approve the personnel report reluctantly. Is there a second? Second. Um, any discussion? Seeing none, all of those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much and welcome. And thank you, Jan. We will have other opportunities, I think, to thank you for all that you've done for us. We really appreciate your hanging in there until August to help us um, enact some of those uh, referendum dollars and, and enact the plan that you've put together. So thank you. So then moving on, on to the agenda is the board member reports and discussions. Mr. Dunlap. I always hate going first because everybody gets to respond to what I say <laughs> later yeah. on. Set the tone here. <laughs> <laughs> Pressure's on. I just want to thank the, the student councils that are presented tonight. Uh, the middle school did a great job, and, and you're right, they are a fundraising machine. I had to look at that number a couple times. But <laughs> man, um, we should put them in charge of getting air conditioning for the gymnasium or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> And then I'd like to have a, a con congratulations to all the seniors that will be graduating this year. And like usual, I want to tell them to uh, have a lot of fun this spring, but above everything else, be safe. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Young. Sorry, Tom isn't here. He would have been next, so. So, uh, I... Sorry. Um, I have something I want to bring up, but like I was talking with Katie and uh, I believe Gary. 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 Uh, <laughs> before, should I bring it up or no? I would maybe talk to Dr. Carlson. Okay, but with the subject on the block schedule. Uh, do you want me to talk with some students to ask their opinion on yeah. if it's absolutely helping them or like not helping them learn? Yes. No, it might be good to talk to students and even some of the faculty I know see what their opinions are too that you interact with on a daily basis. And the, and the students, that would be great. Get what do you think feedback. of it personally? Do you like it? Personally, I like it. Uh, I guess I like having four four homework or four classes that have homework in a day rather than eight mm -hmm. so that clears up my after school schedule and it's easier to like schedule out uh, between my sports and other activities so. and you said you're pretty involved in sports and activities so yeah okay anything else no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. And then um, Anita. Um, I wanted to say uh, welcome, Dr. Mueller, and thank you, Jan. We reluctantly accepting your um, retirement. Um, I also just wanted to put out a reminder about the senior banquet on the 20th um, at, I think it's at 5 o'clock. I'm trying to check it at the Lacrosse 530. Center. 5.30. Thank you, Bob. 
at the lacrosse center so if everyone could get back to mrs coleman and let them know um, i know in the past we haven't had a real big showing of school board members but it's pretty worthwhile so um look at it this way it's like the school board convention but you don't have to go all the way to milwaukee so <laughs> Um, trying to think. I think that's all I have. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, Kate, Mayor. Um, let's see what Anita said. Um, yes, Dr. Mueller, um, very good to see you here tonight. About to embark in a much busier schedule, I'm guessing, and I appreciate <laughs> that. Dr. Carlson can attest to that, I'm sure. Um, uh, Jan Wee, no! That's all <laughs> yeah. I have to say. Um, I'm going to grab her leg. She's yeah, you know, and it's spring, so what Gary said too. All our seniors, go out there, be safe. We love you. Thank you to all the teachers that helped them get there from their pre-K through their grade 12. Um, every graduating senior has been influenced by tons and tons of our staff, and I really appreciate that. Hey, thank you. Lisa Collins. I would like to have the order reversed so that I don't get at the end and sound so repetitive, but um, also welcome to Dr. Mueller and Jan. I am, we're going to figure this out, how we can go around longer, I don't know. Um, and what else? I think that's pretty much it. Other than the middle school student council, I agree. It's like, I, it's amazing what these young people are doing. and. Um, the energy that they bring and they've must they've got a great leader though I mean it takes a, a leader to be able to get kids that motivated to to give back to the community so I want to um, praise their leader you know that's helping them directing them too okay thank you mm -hmm. uh, mr. Menninger uh, I'm just gonna simply say ditto to just about everything that has been set <laughs> up to this point um, I also do want to add the buildings and grounds committee did meet earlier tonight and uh, we were presented with some very preliminary uh, information in regards to looking at some of the uh, new developments that are planned um, for the village of Holman and how that may or may not impact our growth projections for schools and just starting to take a look at some of that data that was being presented so just wanted to make everyone aware that those things are being looked at and hope to have more information for the board uh, in the future with respect to that thank you I would note that this Wednesday we have a personnel and governance committee it will be the last meeting of the year um, compensation model um, it canceled we did not have a meeting last Wednesday we dr. Carlson and uh, mr. Clark are going to put together a summary of our activities um, for that committee and then we'll begin next August to um, ramp that up but we are in the process we've got this rubric that we have developed um, dr. Carlson has been work working really hard on getting that finalized and we have then looked at other models that are being used out there by other school districts so it'll be a good time to start next fall um, looking at what they've done and solidified for this year um, as because a lot of them are still in flux and so um, it will be a good good timing for us so we will be reporting out on that I would um, say that uh, it's committee um, time so that if you can identify I know Christina um, I did you share in the folder did I ask you to do that or I forget to ask you to do that but if you could share with the, um, the board members their committees from last year and then let me know what your committee preferences are I don't see a big shakeup since we didn't have any change in um, school board membership so um, but if you want to move around you know sometimes board members want to move around to different committees to get a different feel we certainly can do that um, but if you could you know let me know then I know most committees are wrapping up and then some take a, a break in the summer some don't um, but we will be looking at things um, to begin next fall then um, and of course welcome to Chris um, you know as our new district administrator we're really pleased to have you and have you here and to listen this evening um, I just would like to say um, 
to everyone regarding the questions that are being asked about these positions, you know, please don't take that in a negative way. These are two positions that aren't in the classroom and, a bo and the board has been very conscientious about making sure that we're comfortable with those changes and initiating new positions as, as those, especially with what we're hearing now from Madison. We thought there was some light at the end of the tunnel with new revenues potential and now we're hearing that that just isn't going to be the case. Um, and so I think we, um, Mr. Brown is in the audience and he's always saying, you don't ask enough questions. Well, we have been asking a lot of questions on these sorts of things because it is a big investment for us. And again, when it's a big investment, not in the classroom, but we have decided as a board that we want to be data driven. And so with that comes some responsibility to provide the tools and the resources to make sure that that's, that's there. So whatever we come to, I think in terms of, and we, we see this sometimes with decisions that we make as a board, sometimes it takes a little bit of work for us to get around to make a decision. But when we do that, such as the referendum, you know, we had a little bit of angst about whether we should go to referendum or not, but when we did, we, I think we're all on board with that decision. We all went to referendum and look at the success that that was. And I see this kind of in the same place, that we, we just are asking those difficult questions and it shouldn't be looked at as a negative. We just want to be very thorough before we, we make any decisions that way. So please don't be discouraged. Um, and that's all I have. Except to say the 263 handshakes, I can't wait because that's the most fun, <laughs> most fun thing to do. 264. But I will, I should, if I still have my cold, I'll have to bring some hand sanitizer because <laughs> this, I don't know if it's whatever. <laughs> anyway, I would just note that um, the meeting, board meeting schedule, May 26th is a Tuesday. That is our uh, memorial week meeting. May 20th, as was noted, is the senior banquet at 5.30. May 23rd is the graduation ceremony at 1. If you could be there at least 20 minutes early, that would be appreciated. Um, the retiree reception is May 28th at 3.30 at the district office here. And June 3rd is the CESA 4 annual convention in West Salem. Any um, reflection for the board meeting? Otherwise, Kate, if you would read the closed session motion. Absolutely. Be it resolved that the Board of Education moves to executive session as per Wisconsin statute 19.851C for the purpose of considering employment, promotion, compensation, or performance evaluation data of any public employee over which the governmental body has jurisdiction or exercises responsibility. In this case, consider the potential retirement of an employee. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? Okay, then if you would do the roll call, please. Absolutely. <coughs> Mr. Dunlap? Yes. Mr. Cruz is excused. Mrs. Hancock? Yes. Ms. Jagsinski? Yes. Myself, yes. Ms. Collins? <laughs> yes. <laughs> And Mr. Maniger. Yes. Okay, we will reconvene in about four minutes, five minutes.